Chapter Eleven of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tyke Hines. Treats of Mr. Fang, the police magistrate, and furnishes a slight specimen of his mode of administering justice. The offence had been committed within the district, and indeed in the immediate neighbourhood of a very notorious metropolitan police office. The crowd had only the satisfaction of accompanying Oliver through two or three streets, and down a place called Mutton Hill, when he was led beneath a low archway and up a dirty court, into this dispensary of summary justice by the back way. It was a small paved yard into which they turned, and here they encountered a stout man with a bunch of whiskers on his face and a bunch of keys in his hand. "'What's the matter now?' said the man carelessly. "'A young fogel hunter replied the man who had Oliver in charge. "'Are you the party that's been robbed, sir?' inquired the man with the keys. "'Yes, I am,' replied the old gentleman. "'But I am not sure that this boy actually took the handkerchief. I—I I would rather not press the case.' "'You must go before the magistrate now, sir,' replied the man. "'His worship will be disengaged in half a minute. Now, young gallows—' This was an invitation to Oliver to enter through a door which he unlocked as he spoke, and which led into a stone cell. Here he was searched, and nothing being found upon him locked up. This cell was in size and shape something like an area cellar, only not so light. It was most intolerably dirty, for it was Monday morning, and it had been tenanted by six drunken people who had been locked up elsewhere since Saturday night. But this is little. In our station-houses men and women are every night confined on the most trivial charges, the word is worth noting, in dungeons compared with which those in Newgate, occupied by the most atrocious felons, tried, found guilty, and under sentence of death are palaces. Let anyone who doubts this compare the two. The old gentleman looked almost as rueful as Oliver when the key grated in the lock. He turned with a sigh to the book which had been the innocent cause of all this disturbance. "'There is something in that boy's face,' said the old gentleman to himself as he walked slowly away, tapping his chin with the cover of the book in a thoughtful manner. "'Something that touches and interests me. Can he be innocent? He looked like—by the by,' exclaimed the old gentleman, halting very abruptly and staring up into the sky. "'Bless my soul! Where have I seen something like that look before?' After musing for some minutes the old gentleman walked with the same meditative face into a back ante-room opening from the yard, and there, retiring into a corner, called up before his mind's eye a vast amphitheatre of faces over which a dusky curtain had hung for many years. No, said the old gentleman, shaking his head, it must be imagination. He wandered over them again. He had called them into view, and it was not easy to replace the shroud that had so long concealed them. There were the faces of friends and foes, and of many that had been almost strangers peering intrusively from the crowd. There were the faces of young and blooming girls that were now old women. There were faces that the grave had changed and closed upon, but which the mind, superior to its power, still dressed in their old freshness and beauty, calling back the lustre of the eyes, the brightness of the smile the beaming of the soul through its mask of clay, and whispering of beauty beyond the tomb, changed but to be heightened, and taken from earth only to be set up as a light, to shed a soft and gentle glow upon the path to heaven. But the old gentleman could recall no one countenance of which Oliver's features bore a trace. So he heaved a sigh over the recollections he awakened, and being happily for himself an absent old gentleman, buried them again in the pages of the musty book. He was roused by a touch on the shoulder, and a request from the man with the keys to follow him into the office. He closed his book hastily, and was at once ushered into the imposing presence of the renowned Mr. Fang. The office was a front parlour with a panelled wall. Mr. Fang sat behind a bar at the upper end, and on one side of the door was a sort of wooden pen in which poor little Oliver was already deposited trembling very much at the awfulness of the scene. Mr. Fang was a lean, long-backed, stiff-necked, middle-sized man, with no great quantity of hair, and what he had growing on the back and sides of his head. His face was stern and much flushed. 
if he were not really in the habit of drinking rather more than was exactly good for him, he might have brought an action against his countenance for libel, and have recovered heavy damages. The old gentleman bowed respectfully, and, advancing to the magistrate's desk, said, suiting the action to the word, "'That is my name and address, sir.' He then withdrew a pace or two, and, with another polite and gentlemanly inclination of the head, waited to be questioned. Now it so happened that Mr. Fang was at that moment perusing a leading article in a newspaper of the morning, adverting to some recent decision of his, and commending him for the three hundred and fiftieth time to the special and particular notice of the Secretary of State for the Home Department. He was out of temper, and he looked up with an angry scowl. "'Who are you?' said Mr. Fang. The old gentleman pointed with some surprise to his card. "'Officer,' said Mr. Fang, tossing the card contemptuously away with the newspaper, "'who is this fellow?' "'My name, sir,' said the old gentleman, speaking like a gentleman, "'my name, sir, is Brownlow. Permit me to inquire the name of the magistrate who offers a gratuitous and unprovoked insult to a respectable person, under the protection of the bench.' Saying this, Mr. Brownlow looked around the office as if in search of some person who would afford him the required information. "'Officer,' said Mr. Fang, throwing the paper on one side, "'what's this fellow charged with?' "'He's not charged at all, Your Worship,' replied the officer. "'He appears against this boy, Your Worship.' His Worship knew this perfectly well, but it was a good annoyance and a safe one. "'Appears against the boy, does he?' said Mr. Fang, surveying Mr. Brownlow contemptuously from head to foot. "'Swear him.' "'Before I am sworn, I must beg to say one word,' said Mr. Brownlow, "'and that is, that I really never, without actual experience, could have believed—' "'Hold your tongue, sir,' said Mr. Fang peremptorily. "'I will not, sir,' replied the old gentleman. "'Hold your tongue this instant, or I'll have you turned out of the office,' said Mr. Fang. "'You are an insolent, impertinent fellow. How dare you bully a magistrate!' "'What?' exclaimed the old gentleman, reddening. "'Swear this person,' said Fang to the clerk. "'I'll not hear another word. Swear him.' Mr. Brownlow's indignation was greatly roused, but reflecting, perhaps, that he might only injure the boy by giving vent to it, he suppressed his feelings and submitted to be sworn at once. "'Now,' said Fang, "'what's the charge against this boy? What have you got to say, sir?' "'I was standing at a bookstall,' Mr. Brownlow began. "'Hold your tongue, sir,' said Mr. Fang. "'Policeman. Where's the policeman?' Here, swear this policeman. Now, policeman, what is this?" The policeman, with becoming humility, related how he had taken the charge, how he had searched Oliver and found nothing on his person, and how that was all he knew about it. "'Are there any witnesses?' inquired Mr. Fang. "'None, Your Worship,' replied the policeman. Mr. Fang sat silent for some minutes, and then, turning round to the prosecutor, said in a towering passion, do you mean to state what your complaint against this boy is, man, or do you not? You have been sworn. Now, if you stand there refusing to give evidence, I'll punish you for disrespect to the bench. I will by—' By what or by whom nobody knows, for the clerk and jailer coughed very loud just at the right moment, and the former dropped a heavy book upon the floor, thus preventing the word from being heard, accidentally, of course. With many interruptions and repeated insults, Mr. Brownlow contrived to state his case observing that in the surprise of the moment he had run after the boy because he had seen him running away, and expressing his hope that if the magistrate should believe him, although not actually the thief, to be connected with the thieves, he would deal as leniently with him as justice would allow. "'He has been hurt already,' said the old gentleman in conclusion. "'And I fear,' he added with great energy, looking towards the bar, "'I really fear that he is ill.' "'Oh, yes, I dare say,' said Mr. Fang, with a sneer. "'Come, none of your tricks here, you young vagabond. They won't do. What's your name?' Oliver tried to reply, but his tongue failed him. He was deadly pale, and the whole place seemed turning round and round. "'What's your name, you hardened scoundrel?' demanded Mr. Fang. "'Officer, what's his name?' This was addressed to a bluff old fellow in a striped waistcoat, who was standing by the bar. He bent over Oliver and repeated the inquiry but finding him really incapable of understanding the question, and knowing that his not replying would only infuriate the magistrate the more, and add to the severity of his sentence, he hazarded a guess. "'He says his name's Tom White, Your Worship,' said the kind-hearted thief-taker. "'No, he won't speak out, won't he?' said Fang. "'Very well, very well. Where does he live?' "'Where he can, Your Worship,' 
replied the officer, again pretending to receive Oliver's answer. "'Has he any parents?' inquired Mr. Fang. "'He says they died in his infancy, Your Worship,' replied the officer, hazarding the usual reply. At this point of the inquiry Oliver raised his head, and looking round with imploring eyes murmured a feeble prayer for a draught of water. "'Stuff and nonsense!' said Mr. Fang. "'Don't try to make a fool of me!' "'I think he really is ill, Your Worship,' remonstrated the officer. "'I know better,' said Mr. Fang. We'll "'Take care of him, officer,' said the old gentleman, raising his hands instinctively. "'He'll fall down.' "'Stand away, officer,' cried Fang. "'Let him if he likes.' Oliver availed himself of the kind permission and fell to the floor in a fainting fit. The men in the office looked at each other, but no one dared to stir. "'I knew he was shamming,' said Fang, as if this were incontestable proof of the fact. "'Let him lie there. He'll soon be tired of that.' "'How do you propose to deal with the case, sir?' inquired the clerk in a low voice. "'Summarily,' replied Mr. Fang. "'He stands committed for three months. Hard labour, of course. Clear the office.' The door was opened for this purpose, and a couple of men were preparing to carry the insensible boy to his cell, when an elderly man of decent but poor appearance, clad in an old suit of black, rushed hastily into the office and advanced towards the bench. "'Stop! Stop! Don't take him away!' "'For heaven's sake, stop a moment!' cried the newcomer, breathless with haste. Although the presiding genii in such an office as this exercise a summary and arbitrary power over the liberties, the good name, the character, almost the lives of Her Majesty's subjects, especially of the poorer class, and although within such walls enough fantastic tricks are daily played to make the angels blind with weeping, they are closed to the public, save through the medium of the daily press. Nor where virtually, then, Mr. Fang was consequently not a little indignant to see an unbidden guest enter in such irreverent disorder. "'What is this? Who is this? Turn this man out! Clear the office!' cried Mr. Fang. "'I will speak!' cried the man. "'I will not be turned out. I saw it all. I keep the bookstall. I demand to be sworn. I will not be put down. Mr. Fang, you must hear me. You must not refuse, sir.' The man was right. His manner was determined, and the matter was growing rather too serious to be hushed up. "'Swear the man,' growled Mr. Fang, with a very ill grace. "'Now, man, what have you got to say?' "'This,' said the man, "'I saw three boys, two others and the prisoner here, loitering on the opposite side of the way when this gentleman was reading. The robbery was committed by another boy. I saw it done. I saw that this boy was perfectly amazed and stupefied by it.' Having by this time recovered a little breath, the worthy bookstall-keeper proceeded to relate, in a more coherent manner, the exact circumstances of the robbery. "'Why didn't you come here before?' said Fang, after a pause. "'I hadn't a soul to mind the shop,' replied the man. "'Everybody who could have helped me had joined in the pursuit. I could get nobody till five minutes ago, and I've run here all the way.' "'The prosecutor was reading, was he?' inquired Fang, after another pause. "'Yes,' replied the man. "'The very book he has in his hand.' "'No, that book, eh?' said Fang. "'Is it paid for?' "'No, it is not,' replied the man, with a smile. Oh, "'Dear me, I forgot all about it,' exclaimed the absent old gentleman innocently. "'A nice person to prefer a charge against a poor boy,' said Fang, with a comical effort to look humane. "'I consider, sir, that you have obtained possession of that book under very suspicious and disreputable circumstances, and you may think yourself very fortunate that the owner of the property declines to prosecute.' Let this be a lesson to you, my man, or the law will overtake you yet. The boy is discharged. Clear the office. Damn me! cried the old gentleman, bursting out with the rage he had kept down so long. Oh, damn me, I'll— Clear the office, said the magistrate. Officers, do you hear? Clear the office. The mandate was obeyed, and the indignant Mr. Brownlow was conveyed out with the book in one hand and the bamboo cane in the other, in a perfect frenzy of rage and defiance. He reached the yard, and his passion vanished in a moment. Little Oliver Twist lay on his back on the pavement, with his shirt unbuttoned and his temples bathed with water, his face a deadly white, and a cold tremble convulsing his whole frame. "'Poor boy! Poor boy!' said Mr. Brownlow, bending over him. "'Call a coach, somebody, pray, directly!' A coach was obtained, and Oliver, having been carefully laid on the seat, the old gentleman got in and sat himself on the other. "'May I accompany you?' said the bookstall-keeper, looking in. "'Bless me, yes, my dear sir,' said Mr. Brownlow quickly. "'I forgot you. Dear, dear, I have this unhappy book still. Jump in. Poor fellow, there's no time to lose.' 
The bookstall keeper got into the coach, and away they drove. End of chapter 11《12 of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tyg Hines. In which Oliver is taken better care of than he ever was before, and in which the narrator reverts to the merry old gentleman and his youthful friends. The coach rattled away over nearly the same ground as that which Oliver had traversed when he first entered London in company with the Dodger and, turning a different way when it reached the Angel at Islington, stopped at length before a neat house, in a quiet, shady street near Pentonville. Here a bed was prepared, without loss of time, in which Mr. Brownlow saw his young charge carefully and comfortably deposited, and here he was tended with a kindness and solicitude that knew no bounds. But for many days Oliver remained insensible to all the goodness of his new friends. The sun rose and sank and rose and sank again, and many times after that, and still the boy lay stretched on his uneasy bed, dwindling away beneath the dry and wasting heat of fever. The worm does not work more surely on the dead body than does this slow creeping fire upon the living frame. Weak and thin and pallid, he awoke at last from what seemed to have been a long and troubled dream, feebly raising himself in the bed. With his head resting on his trembling arm, he looked anxiously around. "'What room is this? Where have I been brought to?' said Oliver. "'This is not the place I went to sleep in.' He uttered these words in a feeble voice, being very faint and weak, but they were overheard at once. The curtain at the bed's head was hastily drawn back, and a motherly old lady, very neatly and precisely dressed, rose as she undrew it from an armchair close by, in which she had been sitting at needlework. "'Hush, my dear said the old lady softly. You must be very quiet or you will be ill again. And you have been very bad, as bad as bad could be, pity nigh. Lie down again, there's a dear. With those words the old lady very gently placed Oliver's head upon the pillow, and smoothing back his hair from his forehead, looked so kindly and lovingly into his face that he could not help placing his little withered hand in hers and drawing it round his neck. Save us, said the old lady with tears in her eyes. What a grateful little dear it is, pretty creature! What would his mother feel if she sat by him as I have, and could see him now? Perhaps she does see me, whispered Oliver, folding his hands together. Perhaps she has sat by me. I almost feel as if she had. That was the fever, my dear, said the old lady mildly. I suppose it was, replied Oliver, because heaven is a long way off, and they are too happy there to come down to the bedside of a poor boy. But if she knew I was ill, she must have pitied me even there, for she was very ill herself before she died. She can't know anything about me, though," added Oliver, after a moment's silence. If she had seen me hurt, it would have made her sorrowful, and her face has always looked sweet and happy when I have dreamed of her. The old lady made no reply to this, but wiping her eyes first, and her spectacles which lay on the counterpane afterwards, as if they were part and parcel of those features, brought some cool stuff for Oliver to drink, and then, patting him on the cheek, told him he must lie very quiet or he would be ill again. So Oliver kept very still, partly because he was anxious to obey the kind old lady in all things, and partly, to tell the truth, because he was completely exhausted with what he had already said. He soon fell into a gentle doze, from which he was awakened by the light of a candle, which, being brought near the bed, showed him a gentleman with a very large and loud ticking gold watch in his hand, who felt his pulse and said he was a great deal better. "'You are a great deal better, are you not, my dear?' said the gentleman. "'Yes, thank you, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Yes, I know you are,' said the gentleman. "'You're hungry too, aren't you?' "'No, sir,' answered Oliver. Hm, said the gentleman. No, I know you're not. He's not hungry, Mrs. Bedwin, said the gentleman, looking very wise. The old lady made a respectful inclination of the head, which seemed to say that she thought the doctor was a very clever man. The doctor appeared much of the same opinion himself. You feel sleepy, don't you, my dear? said the doctor. No, sir, replied Oliver. No, said the doctor, with a very shrewd and satisfied look. You're not sleepy, nor thirsty, are you?" "'Yes, sir, rather thirsty,' answered Oliver. 
"'Just as I expected, Mrs. Bedwin,' said the doctor. "'It's very natural that he should be thirsty. "'You may give him a little tea, ma'am, and some dried toast without any butter. "'Don't keep him too warm, ma'am, but be careful that you don't let him be too cold. "'Will you have the goodness?' The old lady dropped a curtsy. The doctor, after tasting the cool stuff and expressing a qualified approval of it, hurried away, his boots creaking in a very important and wealthy manner as he went downstairs. Oliver dozed off again soon after this. When he awoke it was nearly twelve o'clock. The old lady tenderly bade him good-night shortly afterwards, and left him in charge of a fat old woman who had just come, bringing with her in a little bundle a small prayer-book and a large nightcap. Putting the latter on her head and the former on the table, the old woman, after telling Oliver that she had come to sit up with him, drew her chair close to the fire, and went off into a series of short naps, checkered at frequent intervals with sundry tumblings forward and diverse moans and chokings. These, however, had no worse effect than causing her to rub her nose very hard, and then fall asleep again. And thus the night crept slowly on. Oliver lay awake for some time, counting the little circles of light which the reflection of the rushlight shade threw upon the ceiling, or tracing with his languid eyes the intricate pattern of the paper on the wall. The darkness and the deep stillness of the room were very solemn, as they brought into the boy's mind the thought that death had been hovering there for many days and nights, and might yet fill it with the gloom and dread of his awful presence. He turned his face upon the pillow and fervently prayed to heaven. Gradually he fell into that deep, tranquil sleep which ease from recent suffering alone imparts, that calm and peaceful rest which it is pain to wake from, who, if this were death, would be roused again to all the struggles and turmoils of life, to all its cares for the present, its anxieties for the future, and, more than all, its weary recollections of the past. It had been bright day for hours when Oliver opened his eyes. He felt cheerful and happy. The crisis of the disease was safely past. He belonged to the world again. In three days' time he was able to sit in an easy chair, well propped up with pillows, and as he was still too weak to walk, Mrs. Bedwin had him carried downstairs into the little housekeeper's room which belonged to her. Having him set here by the fireside, the good old lady sat herself down too, and being in a state of considerable delight at seeing him so much better, forthwith began to cry most violently. "'Never mind me, my dear,' said the old lady. "'I'm only having a regular good cry. There, it's all over now, and I'm quite comfortable.' "'You are very, very kind to me, ma'am,' said Oliver. "'Well, you never mind that, my dear,' said the old lady. "'That's got nothing to do with your broth, and it's full time you had it, for the doctor says Mr. Brownlow may come in to see you this morning, and we must get up our best looks, because the better we look, the more he'll be pleased.' and with this the old lady applied herself to warming up in a little saucepan a basin full of broth, strong enough, Oliver thought, to furnish an ample dinner, when reduced to the regulation strength, for three hundred and fifty paupers at the lowest computation. "'Are you fond of pictures, dear?' inquired the old lady, seeing that Oliver had fixed his eyes most intently on a portrait which hung against the wall just opposite his chair. "'I don't quite know, ma'am.' said Oliver, without taking his eyes from the canvas. I have seen so few that I hardly know. What a beautiful, mild face that lady's is! Ah, said the old lady, painters always make ladies out prettier than they are, or they wouldn't get any custom child. The man that invented the machine for taking likenesses, and might have known that would never succeed, is a deal too honest. A deal, said the old lady, laughing very heartily at her own acuteness. Is, is that a likeness, ma'am? said Oliver. Yes, said the old lady, looking up for a moment from the broth. That's a portrait. Whose, ma'am? asked Oliver. Well, really, my dear, I don't know, answered the old lady in a good-humoured manner. It's not a likeness of anybody that you or I know, I expect. It seems to strike your fancy, dear. It is so pretty, replied Oliver. Why, sure you're not afraid of it, said the old lady observing in great surprise the look of awe with which the child regarded the painting. "'Oh, no, no,' returned Oliver quickly, "'but the eyes look so sorrowful, and where I sit they seem fixed upon me. It makes my heart beat,' added Oliver in a low voice, as if it was alive and wanted to speak to me but couldn't. 
"'Lord save us!' exclaimed the old lady, starting. "'Don't talk in that way, child. You're weak and nervous after your illness. Let me wheel your chair round to the other side, and then you won't see it.' "'There,' said the old lady, suiting the action to the word. "'You don't see it now at all events.' Oliver did see it in his mind's eye as distinctly as if he had not altered his position, but he thought it better not to worry the kind old lady, so he smiled gently when she looked at him, and Mrs. Bedwin, satisfied that he felt more comfortable, salted and broke bits of toasted bread into the broth, with all the bustle befitting so solemn a preparation. Oliver got through it with extraordinary expedition. He had scarcely swallowed the last spoonful when there came a soft rap at the door. "'Come in,' said the old lady and in walked Mr. Brownlow. Now the old gentleman came in as brisk as need be, but he had no sooner raised his spectacles on his forehead and thrust his hands behind the skirts of his dressing-gown to take a good long look at Oliver than his countenance underwent a great variety of odd contortions. Oliver looked very worn and shadowy from sickness, and made an ineffectual attempt to stand up out of respect to his benefactor, which terminated in a sinking back into the chair again and the fact is, if truth must be told, that Mr. Brownlow's heart, being large enough for six ordinary old gentlemen of humane disposition, forced a supply of tears into his eyes by some hydraulic process which we are not sufficiently philosophical to be in a condition to explain. "'Poor boy, poor boy,' said Mr. Brownlow, clearing his throat. "'I'm rather hoarse this morning, Mrs. Bedwin. I'm afraid I've caught cold.' "'I hope not, sir,' said Mrs. Bedwin. Everything you've had has been well aired, sir. I don't know, Bedwin. I don't know, said Mr. Brownlow. I rather think I had a damp napkin at dinner time yesterday. But never mind that. How do you feel, my dear? Very happy, sir, replied Oliver, and very grateful indeed, sir, for your goodness to me. Good boy, said Mr. Brownlow stoutly. Have you given him any nourishment, Bedwin? Any slops, eh? He has just had a basin of beautiful strong broth, sir replied Mrs. Bedwin, drawing herself up slightly and laying strong emphasis on the last word, to intimate that between slops and broth well compounded there existed no affinity or connection whatsoever. Ugh, said Mr. Brownlow, with a slight shudder. A couple of glasses of port wine would have done him a great deal more good, wouldn't they, Tom White, eh? My name is Oliver, sir, replied the little invalid with a look of great astonishment. Oliver, said Mr. Brownlow. Oliver what? Oliver White, eh? No, sir. Twist. Oliver Twist. Queer name, said the old gentleman. What made you tell the magistrate your name was White? I never told him so, sir, returned Oliver in amazement. This sounded so like a falsehood that the old gentleman looked somewhat sternly in Oliver's face. It was impossible to doubt him. There was truth in every one of his thin and sharpened lineaments. Some mistake, said Mr. Brownlow. But although his motive for looking steadily at Oliver no longer existed, the old idea of the resemblance between his features and some familiar face came upon him so strongly that he could not withdraw his gaze. I hope you are not angry with me, sir, said Oliver, raising his eyes beseechingly. No, no, replied the old gentleman. Why, what's this? Bedwin, look there. As he spoke he pointed hastily to the picture over Oliver's head, and then to the boy's face. There was its living copy. The eyes, the head, the mouth, every feature was the same. The expression was, for the instant, so precisely alike that the minutest line seemed copied with startling accuracy. Oliver knew not the cause of this sudden exclamation, for, not being strong enough to bear the start it gave him, he fainted away. A weakness on his part which affords the narrative an opportunity of relieving the reader from suspense, in behalf of the two young pupils of the merry old gentleman, and of recording that when the dodger and his accomplished friend Master Bates joined in the hue and cry which was raised at Oliver's heels, in consequence of their executing an illegal conveyance of Mr. Brownlow's personal property, as has already been described, they are actuated by a very laudable and becoming regard for themselves and forasmuch as the freedom of the subject and the liberty of the individual are among the first and proudest boasts of a true-hearted Englishman, so I need hardly beg the reader to observe that this action should tend to exalt them in the opinion of all public and patriotic men. 
in almost as great a degree as this strong proof of their anxiety for their own preservation and safety goes to corroborate and confirm the little code of laws which certain profound and sound judging philosophers have laid down as the main springs of nature's deeds and actions the said philosophers very wisely reducing the good lady's proceedings to matters of maxim and theory and by a very neat and pretty compliment to her exalted wisdom and understanding putting entirely out of sight any considerations of heart or generous impulse and feeling for these are matters totally beneath a female who is acknowledged by universal admission to be far above the numerous little foibles and weaknesses of her sex if i wanted any further proof of the strictly philosophical nature of the conduct of these young gentlemen in their very delicate predicament i should at once find it in the fact also recorded in a foregoing part of this narrative of their quitting the pursuit when the general attention was fixed upon oliver and making immediately for their home by the shortest possible cut although i do not mean to assert that this is usually the practice of renowned and learned sages to shorten the road to any great conclusion their course indeed being rather to lengthen the distance by various circumlocutions and discursive staggerings like unto those in which drunken men under the pressure of a too mighty flow of ideas are prone to indulge still i do mean to say and do say distinctly that it is the invariable practice of many mighty philosophers in carrying out their theories to evince great wisdom and foresight in providing against every possible contingency which can be supposed at all likely to affect themselves thus to do a great right you may do a little wrong and you may take any means which the end to be attained will justify the amount of the right or the amount of the wrong or indeed the distinction between the two being left entirely to the philosopher concerned to be settled and determined by his clear comprehensive and impartial view of his own particular case it was not until the two boys had scoured with great rapidity through a most intricate maze of narrow streets and courts that they ventured to halt beneath a low and dark archway having remained silent here just long enough to recover breath to speak master bates uttered an exclamation of amusement and delight and bursting into an uncontrollable fit of laughter flung himself upon a doorstep and rolled thereon in a transport of mirth what's the matter inquired the dodger <laughs> <laughs> roared charley bates oh your noise remonstrated the dodger looking cautiously round do you want to get grabbed stupid i can't help it said charley i can't help it to see him splitting away at that pace and cutting round the corners and knocking up again the posts and starting on again as if he was made of iron as well as them and me with the wipe in my pocket singing out after him oh my eye the vivid imagination of master bates presented the scene before him in two strong colours as he arrived at this apostrophe he again rolled upon the doorstep and laughed louder than before what will fagin say inquired the dodger taking advantage of the next interval of breathlessness on the part of his friend to propound the question what repeated charley bates ah what said the dodger why what should he say inquired charley stopping rather suddenly in his merriment for the dodger's manner was impressive what should he say mr dawkins whistled for a couple of minutes then taking off his hat scratched his head and nodded thrice what do you mean said charley tooralaloo gammon and spinach the froggy wooden and high cockalurum said the dodger with a slight sneer on his intellectual countenance this was explanatory but not satisfactory master bates felt it so and said again what do you mean the dodger made no reply but putting his hat on again and gathering the skirts of his long-tailed coat under his arm thrust his tongue into his cheek slapped the bridge of his nose some half-dozen times in a familiar but expressive manner and turning on his heel slunk down the court master bates followed with a thoughtful countenance the noise of footsteps on the creaking stairs a few minutes after the occurrence of this conversation roused the merry old gentleman as he sat over the fire with a saveloy and a small loaf in his left hand and a pocket-knife in his right and a pewter-pot on the trivet there was a rascally smile on his white face as he turned round and looking sharply out from under his thick red eyebrows bent his ear towards the door and listened why how's this muttered the jew changing countenance only two of em where's the third they can't a got into trouble Ach! the footsteps approached nearer they reached the landing 
The door was slowly opened, and the Dodger and Charlie Bates entered, closing it behind them. End of chapter 12thirteen of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tig Hines. Some new acquaintances are introduced to the intelligent reader, connected with whom various pleasant matters are related appertaining to this history. Where's Oliver? said the Jew, rising with a menacing look. Where's the boy? The young thieves eyed their preceptor as if they were alarmed at his violence, and looked uneasily at each other, but they made no reply. "'What's become of the boy?' said the Jew, seizing the dodger tightly by the collar, and threatening him with horrid imprecations. "'Speak out, or I'll throttle you!' Mr. Fagin looked so very much in earnest that Charlie Bates, who deemed it prudent in all cases to be on the safe side, and who conceived it by no means improbable that it might be his turn to be throttled second, dropped upon his knees and raised a loud, well-sustained and continuous roar, something between a mad bull and a speaking-trumpet. "'Will you speak?' thundered the Jew, shaking the dodger so much that his keeping in the big coat at all seemed perfectly miraculous. "'Why, the traps have got him, and that's all about it,' said the dodger sullenly. "'Come, let go of me, will you?' and swinging himself at one jerk clean out of the big coat which he left in the Jew's hands, the dodger snatched up the toasting-fork and made a pass at the merry old gentleman's waistcoat, which, if it had taken effect, would have let a little more merriment out than could have been easily replaced. The Jew stepped back in this emergency with more agility than could have been anticipated in a man of his apparent decrepitude, and seizing up the pot prepared to hurl it at his assailant's head. But Charlie Bates at this moment, calling his attention by a perfectly terrific howl, he suddenly altered its destination, and flung it full at that young gentleman. "'Why, what the blazes is in the wind now?' growled a deep voice. "'Who pitched that ear at me? It's well as the beer and not the pot as hit me, or I'd have set with somebody. I might have knowed as nobody but an infernal rich, plundering, thundering old Jew could afford to throw away any drink but water.' And not that unless he'd done the river company every quarter. What's it all about, Fagin? Damn me if my neck handkerchief ain't lined with beer. Come in, you sneaking warmint. What are you stopping outside for, as if you was ashamed of your master? Come in. The man who growled out these words was a stoutly built fellow of about five and thirty, in a black velveteen coat, very soiled drab breeches lace-up half-boots and grey cotton stockings which enclosed a bulky pair of legs, with large swelling calves, the kind of legs which in such costume always look in an unfinished and incomplete state without a set of fetters to garnish them. He had a brown hat on his head, and a dirty belcher handkerchief round his neck, with the long frayed ends of which he smeared the beer from his face as he spoke. He disclosed, when he had done so, a broad heavy countenance, with a beard of three days' growth and two scowling eyes, one of which displayed various particular symptoms, of having been recently damaged by a blow. "'Come in, dear here, growled this engaging ruffian. A white shaggy dog with his face scratched and torn in twenty different places skulked into the room. "'Why didn't you come in afore?' said the man. "'You're getting too proud to owe me afore company, are you? Lie down!' This command was accompanied with a kick which sent the animal to the other end of the room. He appeared well used to it, however, for he coiled himself up in a corner very quietly, without uttering a sound, and winking his very ill-looking eyes twenty times a minute, appeared to occupy himself in taking a survey of the apartment. "'What are you up to? You're treating the boys, you covetous, avaricious, insatiable old fence,' said the man, seating himself deliberately. "'I wonder they don't murder you.' I would if I was them. If I'd been your apprentice, I'd have done it long ago. And no, I couldn't have sold you afterwards, for you're fit for nothing but keeping as a curiosity of ugliness in a glass bottle. And I suppose they don't blow glass bottles large enough. Hush, hush, Mr. Sykes, said the Jew, trembling. Don't speak so loud. None of your mistering, replied the ruffian. You've always made mischief when you come to that. You know my name. Out with it. I shan't disgrace it when the time comes. "'Well, well then, Bill Sykes,' said the Jew, with abject humility. "'You seem out of humour, Bill.' "'Perhaps I am,' replied Sykes. "'I should think you was rather out of sorts, too, unless you mean as little arm you throw pewter pots about, 
as you do when you blab and are you mad said the jew catching the man by the sleeve and pointing towards the boys mr sykes contented himself with tying an imaginary knot under his left ear and jerking his head over on the right shoulder a piece of dumb show which the jew appeared to understand perfectly he then in cant terms with which his whole conversation was plentifully besprinkled but which would be quite unintelligible if they were recorded here demanded a glass of liquor now mind you don't poison it said mr sykes laying his hat upon the table this was said in jest but if the speaker could have seen the evil leer with which the jew bit his pale lip as he turned round to the cupboard he might have thought the caution not wholly unnecessary or the wish at all events to improve upon the distiller's ingenuity not very far from the old gentleman's merry heart after swallowing two or three glasses of spirits mr sykes condescended to take some notice of the young gentleman which gracious act led to a conversation in which the cause and manner of oliver's capture were circumstantially detailed with such alterations and improvements on the truth as to the dodger appeared most advisable under the circumstances i'm afraid said the jew that he may say something which will get us into trouble that's very likely returned sykes with a malicious grin you're blowed upon fagin and i'm afraid you see added the jew speaking as if he had not noticed the interruption and regarding the other closely as he did so i'm afraid that if the game was up with us it might be up with a good many more and that it would come out rather worse for you than it would for me my dear the man started and turned round upon the jew but the old gentleman's shoulders were shrugged up to his ears and his eyes were vacantly staring on the opposite wall there was a long pause every member of the respectable coterie appeared plunged in his own reflections not excepting the dog who by a certain malicious licking of his lips seemed to be meditating an attack upon the legs of the first gentleman or lady he might encounter in the streets when he went out somebody must find out what's been done at the office said mr sykes in a much lower tone than he had taken since he came in the jew nodded assent if he has impeached and is committed there's no fear till he comes out again said mr sykes and then he must be taken care on you must get hold of him somehow again the jew nodded the prudence of this line of action indeed was obvious but unfortunately there was one very strong objection to its being adopted this was that the dodger and charlie bates and fagin and mr william sykes happened one and all to entertain a violent and deeply rooted antipathy to going near a police office on any ground or pretext whatever how long they might have sat and looked at each other in a state of uncertainty not the most pleasant of its kind it is difficult to guess it is not necessary to make any guesses on the subject however for the sudden entrance of the two young ladies whom oliver had seen on a former occasion caused the conversation to flow afresh the very thing said the jew bet will go won't you my dear where's inquired the young lady only just up to the office my dear said the jew coaxingly it is due to the young lady to say that she did not positively affirm that she would not but that she merely expressed an emphatic and earnest desire to be blessed if she would a polite and delicate evasion of the request which shows the young lady to have been possessed of that natural good breeding which cannot bear to inflict upon a fellow-creature the pain of a direct and pointed refusal the jew's countenance fell he turned from this young lady who was gaily not to say gorgeously attired in a red gown green boots and yellow curl papers to the other female nancy my dear said the jew in a soothing manner what do you say that i won't do so it's no use to try it on fagin replied nancy what do you mean by that said mr sykes looking up in a surly manner what i say bill replied the lady collectedly well you're just the very person for it reasoned mr sykes nobody about here knows anything of you and as i don't want him to neither replied nancy in the same composed manner it's rather more no than yes with me bill she'll go fagin said sykes no she won't fagin said nancy yes she will fagin said sykes and mr sykes was right by dint of alternate threats promises and bribes the lady in question was ultimately prevailed upon to undertake the commission she was not indeed withheld by the same considerations as her agreeable friend for having recently removed into the neighbourhood of field lane from the remote but genteel suburb of ratcliffe she was not under the same apprehension of being recognised by any of her numerous acquaintances 
Accordingly, with a clean white apron tied over her gown and her curl papers tucked up under a straw bonnet, both articles of dress being provided from the Jew's inexhaustible stock, Miss Nancy prepared to issue forth on her errand. "'Stop a minute, my dear,' said the Jew, producing a little covered basket. "'Carry that in one hand. It looks more respectable, my dear.' "'Give it a door-key to carry in t'other one, Fagin,' said Sykes. "'It looks real and genuine-like.' "'Yes, yes, my dear, so it does,' said the Jew, hanging a large street-door key on the forefinger of the young lady's right hand. "'There, very good, very good indeed, my dear,' said the Jew, rubbing his hands. "'How, my brother, my poor, dear, sweet, innocent little brother!' exclaimed Nancy, bursting into tears, and wringing the little basket and the street-door key in an agony of distress. "'What's become of them? Where have they taken him to? Oh, do have pity and tell me what's been done with the dear boy, gentlemen. Do, gentlemen, if you please, gentlemen.' Having uttered those words in a most lamentable and heart-broken tone, to the immeasurable delight of our hearers, Miss Nancy paused, winked to the company, nodded smilingly round, and disappeared. "'Ah, she's a clever girl, my dears,' said the Jew, turning round to his young friends and shaking his head gravely, as if in mute admonition to them to follow the bright example they had just beheld. "'She's an honour to her sex, said Mr. Sykes, filling his glass, and smiting the table with his enormous fist. "'Is her elf, and wishing they was all like her.' While these and many other encomiums were being passed on the accomplished Nancy, that young lady made the best of her way to the police office, whither, notwithstanding a little natural timidity, consequent upon walking through the streets alone and unprotected, she arrived in perfect safety shortly afterwards. Entering by the back way, she tapped softly with the key at one of the cell doors and listened. There was no sound within, so she coughed and listened again. Still there was no reply, so she spoke. "'Nolly, dear,' murmured Nancy in a gentle voice. "'Nolly!' There was nobody inside but a miserable, shoeless criminal, who had been taken up for playing the flute, and who, the offence against society having been clearly proved, had been very properly committed by Mr. Fang to the House of Correction for one month, with the appropriate and amusing remark that since he had so much breath to spare, it would be more wholesomely expended on the treadmill than in a musical instrument. He made no answer, being occupied mentally bewailing the loss of the flute, which had been confiscated for the use of the county. So Nancy passed on to the next cell and knocked there. "'Well?' cried a faint and feeble voice. "'Is there a little boy here?' inquired Nancy, with a preliminary sob. "'No,' replied the voice. "'God forbid!' This was a vagrant of sixty-five who was going to prison for not playing the flute, or, in other words, for begging in the streets and doing nothing for his livelihood. In the next cell was another man, who was going to the same prison for hawking tin saucepans without licence, thereby doing something for his living in defiance of the stamp office. But as neither of these criminals answered to the name of Oliver or knew anything about him, Nancy made straight up to the bluff officer in the striped waistcoat, and with the most piteous wailings and lamentations rendered more piteous by a prompt and efficient use of the street-door key and the little basket, demanded her own dear brother. "'I haven't got him, my dear,' said the old man. "'Where is he?' screamed Nancy in a distracted manner. "'Why, the gentleman's got him,' replied the officer. "'What gentleman? Oh, gracious heavens, what gentleman?' exclaimed Nancy. In reply to this incoherent questioning, the old man informed the deeply affected sister that Oliver had been taken ill in the office, and discharged in consequence of a witness having proved the robbery to have been committed by another boy not in custody, and that the prosecutor had carried him away in an insensible condition to his own residence, of and concerning which all the informant knew was that it was somewhere in Pentonville, he having heard the word mentioned in the directions to the coachman. In a dreadful state of doubt and uncertainty the agonised young woman staggered to the gate, and then, exchanging her faltering walk for a swift run, returned by the most devious and complicated route she could think of to the domicile of the Jew. Mr. Bill Sykes no sooner heard the account of the expedition delivered than he very hastily called up the white dog and, putting on his hat, expeditiously departed, without devoting any time to the formality of wishing the company good morning. "'We must know where he is, my dears. He must be found,' said the Jew, greatly excited. 
Jolly, do nothing but skulk about till you bring home some news of him. Nancy, my dear, I must have him found. I trust to you, my dear, and to you and the awful dodger for everything. Stay, stay, added the Jew, unlocking the drawer with a shaking hand. There's money, my dears. I shall shut up this shop to-night. You'll know where to find me. Don't stop here a minute, not an instant, my dears. With these words he pushed them from the room, and carefully double-locking and barring the door behind them, drew from its place of concealment the box which he had unintentionally disclosed to Oliver. Then he hastily proceeded to dispose of the watches and jewellery beneath his clothing. A rap at the door startled him in his occupation. "'Who's there?' he cried in a shrill tone. "'Me,' replied the voice of the dodger through the keyhole. "'What now?' cried the Jew impatiently. "'Is you to be kidnapped to the other ken, Nancy says?' inquired the dodger. "'Yes,' replied the Jew, "'wherever she lays hands on him. Find him, find him out, that's all. I shall know what to do next. Never fear.' The boy murmured a reply of intelligence, and hurried downstairs after his companions. He "'Is not Pete so far?' said the Jew, as he pursued his occupation. "'If he means to blab us among his new friends, we may stop his mouth yet.'" End of chapter 13《Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens — This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tig Hines. Comprising further particulars of Oliver's stay at Mr. Brownlow's, with a remarkable prediction which one Mr. Grimwig uttered concerning him when he went out on an errand. Oliver, soon recovering from the fainting fit into which Mr. Brownlow's abrupt exclamation had thrown him, the subject of the picture was carefully avoided, both by the old gentleman and Mrs. Bedwin, in the conversation that ensued which indeed bore no reference to oliver's history or prospects but was confined to such topics as might amuse without exciting him he was still too weak to get up to breakfast but when he came down into the housekeeper's room next day his first act was to cast an eager glance at the wall in the hope of again looking on the face of the beautiful lady his expectations were disappointed however for the picture had been removed ah said the housekeeper watching the direction of oliver's eyes it is gone you see i see it is ma'am replied oliver why have they taken it away it has been taken down child because mr brownlow said that as it seemed to worry you perhaps it might prevent you getting well you know rejoined the old lady oh no indeed it didn't worry me ma'am said oliver i like to see it i quite loved it well well said the old lady good-humouredly you get well as fast as ever you can dear and it shall be hung up again there i promise you that now let us talk about something else this was all the information oliver could obtain about the picture at that time as the old lady had been so kind to him in his illness he endeavoured to think no more of the subject just then so he listened attentively to a great many stories she told him about an amiable and handsome daughter of hers who was married to an amiable and handsome man and lived in the country and about a son who was a clerk to a merchant in the west indies and who was also such a good young man and wrote such dutiful letters home four times a year that it brought tears into her eyes to talk about them when the old lady had expatiated a long time on the excellences of her children and the merits of her kind good husband besides who had been dead and gone poor dear soul just six and twenty years it was time to have tea after tea she began to teach oliver cribbage which he learnt as quickly as she could teach and at which game they played with great interest and gravity until it was time for the invalid to have some warm wine and water with a slice of dry toast and then to go cosily to bed they were happy days those of oliver's recovery everything was so quiet and neat and orderly everybody so kind and gentle that after the noise and turbulence in the midst of which he had always lived it seemed like heaven itself he was no sooner strong enough to put his clothes on properly than mr brownlow caused a complete new suit and a new cap and a new pair of shoes to be provided for him as oliver was told that he might do what he liked with the old clothes he gave them to a servant who had been very kind to him and asked her to sell them to a jew and keep the money for herself this she very readily did and as oliver looked out of the parlour window and saw the jew roll them up in his bag and walk away he felt quite delighted to think that they were safely gone 
and that there was now no possible danger of his ever being able to wear them again. They were sad rags, to tell the truth, and Oliver had never had a new suit before. One evening about a week after the affair of the picture, as he was sitting talking to Mrs. Bedwin, there came a message down from Mr. Brownlow, that if Oliver Twist felt pretty well he would like to see him in his study, and talk to him a little while. "'Bless us and save us! Wash your hands and let me part your hair nicely for you, child,' said Mrs. Bedwin. "'Dear heart alive! If we had known he would have asked for you, we would have put you in a clean collar and made you as smart as sixpence.' Oliver did as the old lady bade him and although she lamented grievously meanwhile that there was not even time to crimp the little frill that bordered his shirt-collar, he looked so delicate and handsome, despite that important personal advantage, that she went so far as to say, looking at him with great complacency from head to foot, that she really didn't think it would have been possible on the longest notice to have made much difference in him for the better. Thus encouraged, Oliver tapped at the study door. On Mr. Brownlow calling him to come in, he found himself in a little back room, quite full of books, with a window looking into some pleasant little gardens. There was a table drawn up before the window at which Mr. Brownlow was seated reading. When he saw Oliver he pushed the book away from him and told him to come near the table and sit down. Oliver complied, marvelling where the people could be found to read such a great number of books as seemed to be written to make the world wiser which is still a marvel to more experienced people than Oliver Twist, every day of their lives. "'There are a great many books, are there not, my boy?' said Mr. Brownlow, observing the curiosity with which Oliver surveyed the shelves that reached from the floor to the ceiling. "'A great number, sir,' replied Oliver. "'I never saw so many.' "'You shall read them if you behave well,' said the old gentleman kindly. "'And you will like that better than looking at the outsides, that is, in some cases.' because there are books of which the backs and covers are by far the best parts. "'I suppose they are those heavy ones, sir,' said Oliver, pointing to some large quartos, with a good deal of gilding about the binding. "'Not always those,' said the old gentleman, patting Oliver on the head and smiling as he did so. "'There are other equally heavy ones, though of a much smaller size. How would you like to grow up a clever man and write books, eh?' "'I think I would rather read them, sir,' replied Oliver. "'What? Wouldn't you like to be a book-writer?' said the old gentleman. Oliver considered a little while, and at last said he should think it would be a much better thing to be a bookseller, upon which the old gentleman laughed heartily, and declared he had said a very good thing, which Oliver felt glad to have done, though he by no means knew what it was. "'Well, well,' said the old gentleman, composing his features, "'don't be afraid. We won't make an author of you while there's an honest trade to be learnt, nor brick-making to turn to.' "'Thank you, sir,' said Oliver. At the earnest manner of his reply the old gentleman laughed again, and said something about a curious instinct which Oliver, not understanding, paid no very great attention to. "'Now,' said Mr. Brownlow, speaking, if possible, in a kinder, but at the same time in a much more serious manner than Oliver had ever known him assume yet, "'I want you to pay great attention, my boy.' to what I am going to say. I shall talk to you without any reserve, because I am sure you are well able to understand me, as many older persons would be." "'Oh, don't tell me you are going to send me away, sir, pray!' exclaimed Oliver, alarmed at the serious tone of the old gentleman's commencement. "'Don't turn me out of doors to wander the streets again. Let me stay here and be a servant. Don't send me back to the wretched place I came from. Have mercy upon a poor boy, sir!' "'My dear child,' said the old gentleman, moved by the warmth of Oliver's sudden appeal, "'you need not be afraid of my deserting you, unless you give me cause.' "'I never, never will, sir,' interposed Oliver. "'I hope not,' rejoined the old gentleman. "'I do not think you ever will. I have been deceived before in the objects whom I have endeavoured to benefit, but I feel strongly disposed to trust you nevertheless.' and I am more interested in your behalf than I can well account for even to myself. The persons on whom I have bestowed my dearest love lie deep in their graves, but although the happiness and delight of my life lie buried there too, I have not made a coffin of my heart and sealed it up for ever on my best affections. Deep affliction has but strengthened and refined them." As the old gentleman said this in a low voice, more to himself than to his companion, and as he remained silent for a short time afterwards, Oliver sat quite still. "'Well, well,' said the old gentleman at length, in a more cheerful tone, "'I only say this because you have a young heart, 
and knowing that I have suffered great pain and sorrow, you will be more careful, perhaps, not to wound me again. You say you are an orphan, without a friend in the world. All the inquiries I have been able to make confirm the statement. Let me hear your story, where you came from, who brought you up, and how you got into the company in which I found you. Speak the truth, and you shall not be friendless while I live. Oliver's sobs checked his utterance for some minutes. When he was on the point of beginning to relate how he had been brought up at the farm and carried to the workhouse by Mr. Bumble, a peculiarly impatient little double knock was heard at the street door, and the servant, running upstairs, announced Mr. Grimwig. "'Is he coming up?' inquired Mr. Brownlow. "'Yes, sir,' replied the servant. "'He asked if there were any muffins in the house, and, when I told him yes, he said he had come to tea.' Mr. Brownlow smiled, and, turning to Oliver, said that Mr. Grimwig was an old friend of his, and he must not mind his being a little rough in his manners, for he was a worthy creature at bottom, as he had reason to know. "'Shall I go downstairs, sir?' inquired Oliver. "'No,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'I would rather you remained here.' At this moment there walked into the room, supporting himself by a thick stick, a stout old gentleman, rather lame in one leg, who was dressed in a blue coat, striped waistcoat, nankeen breeches and gaiters, and a broad-brimmed white hat with the sides turned up with green. A very small plaited shirt-frill stuck out from his waistcoat, and a very long steel watch-chain with nothing but a key at the end dangled loosely below it. The ends of his white neckerchief were twisted into a ball about the size of an orange. The variety of shapes into which his countenance was twisted defied description. He had a manner of screwing his head on one side when he spoke, and of looking out of the corners of his eyes at the same time, which irresistibly reminded the beholder of a parrot. In this attitude he fixed himself the moment he made his appearance, and, holding out a small piece of orange peel at arm's length, exclaimed in a growling, discontented voice, "'Look here! Do you see this? Isn't it a most wonderful and extraordinary thing that I can't call it a man's house, but I find a piece of this poor surgeon's friend on the staircase. I've been lamed at orange peel once, and I know orange peel will be my death, or I'll be content to eat my own head, sir." This was the handsome offer with which Mr. Grimwig backed and confirmed nearly every assertion he made, and it was the more singular in his case, because even admitting for the sake of argument the possibility of scientific improvements being brought to that pass which will enable a gentleman to eat his own head in the event of his being so disposed, Mr. Grimwig's head was such a particularly large one that the most sanguine man alive could hardly entertain a hope of being able to get through it at a sitting, to put entirely out of the question a very thick coating of powder. "'I'll eat my head, sir,' repeated Mr. Grimwig, striking his stick upon the ground. "'Hello! What's that?' looking at Oliver and retreating a pace or two. "'This is young Oliver Twist, whom we were speaking about,' said Mr. Brownlow. Oliver bowed. "'You don't mean to say that's the boy who had the fever, I hope,' said Mr. Grimwig, recoiling a little more. "'Wait a minute. Don't speak. Stop,' continued Mr. Grimwig abruptly, losing all dread of the fever in his triumph at the discovery. "'That's the boy who had the orange. If that's not the boy who had the orange and threw this bit of peel upon the staircase, I'll eat my head. And his too.' "'No, no, he has not had one,' said Mr. Brownlow, laughing. "'Come, put down your hat and speak to my young friend.' "'I feel strongly on the subject, sir,' said the irritable old gentleman, drawing off his gloves. "'There's always more or less orange peel on the pavement in our street, and I know it's put there by the surgeon's boy at the corner.' A young woman stumbled over a bit last night and fell against my garden railings. Directly she got up I saw her look towards his infernal red lamp with the pantomime light. "'Don't go to him!' I called out of the window. "'He's an assassin, a man-trap!' "'So he is. If he's not—' Here the irascible old gentleman gave a great knock on the ground with a stick, which is always understood by his friends to imply the customary offer, whenever it was not expressed in words. Then, still keeping his stick in his hand, he sat down, and opening a double eyeglass which he wore attached to a broad black riband, took a view of Oliver, who, seeing that he was the object of inspection, coloured and bowed again. "'That's the boy, is it?' said Mr. Grimwig at length. "'That's the boy,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'How are you, boy?' said Mr. Grimwig. "'A great deal better, thank you, sir,' replied Oliver. 
Mr. Brownlow, seeming to apprehend that his singular friend was about to say something disagreeable, asked Oliver to step downstairs and tell Mrs. Bedwin they were ready for tea, which, as he did not half like the visitor's manner, he was very happy to do. "'He's a nice-looking boy, is he not?' inquired Mr. Brownlow. "'I don't know,' replied Mr. Grimwick pettishly. "'Don't know?' "'No, I don't know. I never see any difference in boys. I only knew two sorts of boys, mealy boys and beef-faced boys. And which is Oliver? Mealy. I know a friend who has a beef-faced boy, a fine boy they call him, with a round head and red cheeks and glaring eyes, a horrid boy, with a body and limbs that appear to be swelling out of the seams of his blue clothes, with the voice of a pilot and the appetite of a wolf. I know him, the wretch. Come, said Mr. Brownlow, these are not the characteristics of young Oliver Twist so he needn't excite your wrath. They are not, replied Mr. Grimwig. He may have worse. Here Mr. Brownlow coughed impatiently, which appeared to afford Mr. Grimwig the most exquisite delight. He may have worse, I say, repeated Mr. Grimwig. Where does he come from? Who is he? What is he? He has had a fever. What of that? Fevers are not particular to good people, are they? Bad people have fevers sometimes, haven't they, eh? I knew a man who was hung in Jamaica for murdering his master. He had had a fever six times. He wasn't recommended to mercy on that account. Pooh! Nonsense!" Now the fact was that in the inmost recesses of his own heart Mr. Grimwig was strongly disposed to admit that Oliver's appearance and manner were unusually prepossessing. But he had a strong appetite for contradiction, sharpened on this occasion by the finding of the orange peel and inwardly determining that no man should dictate to him whether a boy was well-looking or not, he had resolved from the first to oppose his friend. When Mr. Brownlow admitted that no one point of inquiry could yet return a satisfactory answer, and that he had postponed any investigation into Oliver's previous history until he thought the boy was strong enough to hear it, Mr. Grimwig chuckled maliciously, and he demanded with a sneer whether the housekeeper was in the habit of counting the plate at night because if she didn't find a tablespoon or two missing some sunshiny morning, why, he would be content to—' and so forth. All this Mr. Brownlow, though himself somewhat of an impetuous gentleman, knowing his friend's peculiarities, bore with great good humour. As Mr. Grimwig at tea was graciously pleased to express his entire approval of the muffins, matters went on very smoothly, and Oliver, who made one of the party, began to feel more at ease than he had yet done in the fierce old gentleman's presence. "'And when are you going to hear a full, true, and particular account of the life and adventures of Oliver Twist?' asked Mr. Grimwick of Mr. Brownlow at the conclusion of the meal, looking sideways at Oliver as he resumed his subject. "'Tomorrow morning,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'I would rather he was alone with me at the time. Come up to me tomorrow morning at ten o'clock, my dear.' "'Yes, sir.' replied Oliver. He answered with some hesitation, because he was confused by Mr. Grimwig's looking so hard at him. "'I'll tell you what,' whispered that gentleman to Mr. Brownlow. "'He won't come up to you to-morrow morning. I saw him hesitate. He's deceiving you, my good friend.' "'I'll swear he is not,' replied Mr. Brownlow warmly. "'If he is not,' said Mr. Grimwig, "'I'll—' And down went the stick. "'I'll answer for that boy's truth with my life,' said Mr. Brownlow, knocking the table. "'And I for his falsehood with my head,' rejoined Mr. Grimwig, knocking the table also. "'We shall see,' said Mr. Brownlow, checking his rising anger. "'We will,' replied Mr. Grimwig, with a provoking smile. "'We will.' As fate would have it, Mrs. Bedwin chanced to bring in at this moment a small parcel of books, which Mr. Brownlow had that morning purchased of the identical bookstall keeper, who was already figured in this history. Having laid them on the table, she prepared to leave the room. "'Stop the boy, Mrs. Bedwin,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'There is something to go back.' "'He is gone, sir,' replied Mrs. Bedwin. "'Call after him,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'It's particular. He's a poor man, and they are not paid for. There are some books to be taken back to.' The street door was opened, Oliver ran one way and the girl ran another, and Mrs. Bedwin stood on the step and screamed for the boy. But there was no boy in sight. Oliver and the girl returned, in a breathless state, to report that there was no tidings of him. "'Dear me, I am very sorry for that,' exclaimed Mr. Brownlow. "'I particularly wish those books to be returned to-night.' "'Send Oliver with them,' said Mr. Grimwig, with an ironical smile. "'He will be sure to deliver them safely, you know.' "'Yes, do let me take them, if you please, sir,' 
said Oliver. "'I'll run all the way, sir.' The old gentleman was just going to say that Oliver should not go out on any account, when a most malicious cough from Mr. Grimwig determined him that he should, and that, by his prompt discharge of the commission, he should prove to him the injustice of his suspicions, on this head at least, at once. "'You shall go, my dear,' said the old gentleman. "'The books are on a chair by my table. Fetch them down.' Oliver, delighted to be of use, brought down the books under his arm in a great bustle, and waited, cap in hand, to hear what message he was to take. "'You are to say,' said Mr. Brownlow, glancing steadily at Grimwig, "'you are to say that you have brought those books back, and that you have come to pay the four pound ten I owe him. This is a five pound note, so you will have to bring back ten shillings change.' "'I won't be ten minutes, sir,' said Oliver eagerly having buttoned up the bank-note in his jacket-pocket, and placed the books carefully under his arm, he made a respectful bow and left the room. Mrs. Bedwin followed him to the street-door, giving him many directions about the nearest way, and the name of the bookseller and the name of the street, all of which Oliver said he clearly understood. Having superadded many injunctions to be sure not to take cold, the old lady at length permitted him to depart. "'Bless his sweet face!' said the old lady, looking after him. I can't bear somehow to let him go out of my sight. At this moment Oliver looked gaily round, and nodded before he turned the corner. The old lady smilingly returned his salutation, and, closing the door, went back to her own room. "'Let me see. He'll be back in twenty minutes at the longest,' said Mr. Brownlow, pulling out his watch and placing it on the table. "'It will be dark by that time.' "'Oh, you really expect him to come back, do you?' inquired Mr. Grimwig. "'Don't you?' asked Mr. Brownlow, smiling. The spirit of contradiction was strong in Mr. Grimwig's breast at the moment, and it was rendered stronger by his friend's confident smile. "'No,' he said, smiting the table with his fist, "'I do not. The boy has a new suit of clothes on his back, and a set of valuable books under his arm, and a five-pound note in his pocket. He'll join his old friends the thieves and laugh at you.' If ever that boy returns to this house, sir, I'll eat my head." With these words he drew his chair closer to the table, and there the two friends sat in silent expectation, the watch between them. It is worthy to remark, as illustrating the importance we attach to our own judgments, and the pride with which we put forth our most rash and hasty conclusions, that although Mr. Grimwig was not by any means a bad-hearted man, and though he would have been unfeignedly sorry to see his respected friend duped and deceived, he really did most earnestly and strongly hope at that moment that Oliver Twist might not come back. It grew so dark that the figures on the dial-plate were scarcely discernible. But there the two old gentlemen continued to sit in silence with the watch between them. End of chapter fourteen. Chapter fifteen of Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tige Hines. Showing how very fond of Oliver Twist the merry old Jew and Miss Nancy were. In the obscure parlour of a low public house in the filthiest part of Little Saffron Hill, a dark and gloomy den where a flaring gaslight burnt all day in the winter time, and where no ray of sun ever shone in the summer, there sat, brooding over a little pewter measure and a small glass, strongly impregnated with the smell of liquor, a man in a velveteen coat, drab shorts, half-boots and stockings, whom even by that dim light no experienced agent of the police would have hesitated to recognise as Mr. William Sykes. At his feet sat a white-coated, red-eyed dog, who occupied himself alternately in winking at his master with both eyes at the same time, and licking a large, fresh cut on one side of his mouth, which appeared to be the result of some recent conflict. "'Keep quiet, you warmint! Keep quiet!' said Mr. Sykes, suddenly breaking silence. Whether his meditations were so intense as to be disturbed by the dog's winking, or whether his feelings were so wrought upon by his reflections that they required all the relief derivable from kicking an unoffending animal to allay them, is matter for argument and consideration. Whatever was the cause, the effect was a kick and a curse, bestowed upon the dog simultaneously. 
Dogs are not generally apt to revenge injuries inflicted upon them by their masters, but Mr. Sykes' dog, having faults of temper in common with his owner, and labouring perhaps at this moment under a powerful sense of injury, made no more ado but at once fixed his teeth into one of the half-boots. Having given it a hearty shake he retired growling under a form, just escaping the pewter measure which Mr. Sykes levelled at his head. "'You would, would you?' said Sykes, seizing the poker in one hand, and deliberately opening with the other a large clasp-knife, which he drew from his pocket. "'Come here, you bone-devil! Come here! Do you hear?' The dog no doubt heard, because Mr. Sykes spoke in the very harshest key of a very harsh voice. But appearing to entertain some unaccountable objection to having his throat cut, he remained where he was, and growled more fiercely than before at the same time grasping the end of the poker between his teeth and biting at it like a wild beast. This resistance only infuriated Mr. Sykes the more, who, dropping on his knees, began to assail the animal most furiously. The dog jumped from right to left and from left to right, snapping, growling, and barking. The man thrust and swore and struck and blasphemed, and the struggle was reaching a most critical point for one or other. When the door suddenly opening, the dog darted out, leaving Bill Sykes with the poker and the clasp-knife in his hands. There must always be two parties to a quarrel, says the old adage. Mr. Sykes, being disappointed of the dog's participation, at once transferred his share of the quarrel to the newcomer. "'What the devil do you come in between me and my dog for?' said Sykes, with a fierce gesture. "'I didn't know, my dear. I didn't know replied Fagin humbly, for the Jew was a newcomer. "'Didn't know, you white-livered thief!' growled Sykes. "'Couldn't you hear the noise?' "'Not the sound of it, as I'm a living man, Bill,' replied the Jew. "'Oh, no, you hear nothing, you don't,' retorted Sykes with a fierce sneer. "'Sneaking in and out, so as nobody hears how you come or go. I wish you had been the dog Fagin half a minute ago.' "'Why?' inquired the Jew with a forced smile. "'Cause the government as cares for the lives of such men as you, as haven't half the pluck of curs, lets a man kill a dog how he likes,' replied Sykes, shutting up the knife with a very expressive look. "'That's why.' The Jew rubbed his hands, and sitting down at the table affected to laugh at the pleasantry of his friend. He was obviously very ill at ease, however. "'Grin away,' said Sykes, replacing the poker and surveying him with savage contempt. Grin away! You'll never have the laugh at me, though, unless it's behind a nightcap. I've got the upper hand over you, Fagin, and damn me, I'll keep it. There, if I go, you go, so take care of me. Well, well, my dear, said the Jew, I know all that. We, we have a mutual interest, Bill, a mutual interest. Huh said Sykes, as if he thought the interest lay rather more on the Jew's side than on his. "'Well, what have you got to say to me?' "'It's all passed safe through the melting pot,' replied Fagin. "'And this is your share. It's rather more than it ought to be, my dear. But as I know you'll do me a good turn another time, and—' "'Stow that gammon,' interposed the robber impatiently. "'Where is it? And over!' "'Yes, yes, Bill. Give me time. Give me time.' replied the Jew soothingly. Here it is, old safe. As he spoke he drew forth an old cotton handkerchief from his breast, and untying a large knot in one corner, produced a small brown paper packet. Sykes, snatching it from him, hastily opened it, and proceeded to count the sovereigns it contained. This is all, is it? inquired Sykes. All, replied the Jew. You haven't opened the parcel and swallowed one or two as you come along, have you? inquired Sykes suspiciously. "'Don't put on an injured look at the question. You've done it many a time. Jerk the tinkler.' These words in plain English conveyed an injunction to ring the bell. It was answered by another Jew, younger than Fagin, but nearly as vile and repulsive in appearance. Bill Sykes merely pointed to the empty measure. The Jew, perfectly understanding the hint, retired to fill it, previously exchanging a remarkable look with Fagin who raised his eyes for an instant, as if in expectation of it, and shook his head in reply so slightly that the action would have been almost imperceptible to an observant third person. It was lost upon Sykes, who was stooping at the moment to tie the boot-lace which the dog had torn. 
Possibly, if he had observed the brief interchange of signals, he might have thought that it boded no good to him. "'Is anybody here, Barney?' inquired Fagin, speaking, now that Sykes was looking on, without raising his eyes from the ground. "'Not a soul,' replied Barney, whose words, whether they came from the heart or not, made their way through the nose. "'Nobody!' inquired Fagin, in a tone of surprise, which perhaps might mean that Barney was at liberty to tell the truth. "'Nobody but Miss Nancy,' replied Barney. "'Nancy!' exclaimed Sykes. "'Where? Strike me blind if I don't honour that there girl for a night of talents!' "'She's been having a plate of boiled beef at the bar,' replied Barney. "'Send her here,' said Sykes, pouring out a glass of liquor. "'Send her here!' Barney looked timidly at Fagin, as if for permission. The Jew remaining silent and not lifting his eyes from the ground, he retired and presently returned ushering in Nancy, who was decorated with a bonnet, apron, basket, and street-door key complete. "'You are on the scent, are you, Nancy?' inquired Sykes, proffering the glass. "'Yes, I am, Bill,' replied the young lady, disposing of its contents. "'And tired enough of it I am, too.' The young brat's been ill and confined to the crib, and— "'Ah, Nancy, dear,' said Fagin, looking up. Now, whether a peculiar contraction of the Jew's red eyebrows and a half-closing of his deeply set eyes warned Miss Nancy that she was disposed to be too communicative, is not a matter of much importance. The fact is all we care for here, and the fact is that she suddenly checked herself, and with several gracious smiles upon Mr. Sykes, turned the conversation to other matters. In about ten minutes' time Mr. Fagin was seized with a fit of coughing, upon which Nancy pulled her shawl over her shoulders and declared it was time to go. Mr. Sykes, finding that he was walking a short part of her way himself, expressed his intention of accompanying her, and they went away together, followed at a little distance, by the dog who stunk out of a back yard as soon as his master was out of sight. The Jew thrust his head out of the room door when Sykes had left it looked after him as he walked up the passage, shook his clenched fist, muttered a deep curse, and then, with a horrible grin, reseated himself at the table, where he was soon deeply absorbed in the interesting pages of the hue and cry. Meanwhile, Oliver Twist, little dreaming that he was within so very short a distance of the merry old gentleman, was on his way to the bookstall. When he got into Clerkenwell he accidentally turned down a by-street which was not exactly in his way but not discovering his mistake until he had got half-way down it, and knowing it must lead in the right direction, he did not think it worth while to turn back, and so marched on as quickly as he could with the books under his arm. He was walking along, thinking how happy and contented he ought to feel, and how much he would give for only one look at poor Dick, who, starved and beaten, might be weeping bitterly at that very moment, when he was startled by a young woman screaming out very loud, "'Oh, my dear brother!' And he had hardly looked up to see what the matter was when he was stopped by having a pair of arms thrown tight around his neck. "'Don't!' cried Oliver, struggling. "'Let go of me. Who is it? What are you stopping me for?' The only reply to this was a great number of loud lamentations from the young woman who had embraced him, and who had a little basket and a street-door key in her hand. "'Oh, my gracious!' said the young woman. "'I have found him! Oh, Oliver, Oliver! Oh, you naughty boy, to make me suffer such distress on your account! Come home, dear, come! Oh, I've found him! Thank gracious goodness heavens, I've found him!' With these incoherent exclamations the young woman burst into another fit of crying, and got so dreadfully hysterical that a couple of women who came up at that moment asked a butcher's boy with a shiny head of hair anointed with suet who was also looking on, whether he didn't think he had better run for the doctor, to which the butcher's boy, who appeared of a lounging, not to say indolent disposition, replied that he thought not. "'Oh, no, no, never mind,' said the young woman, grasping Oliver's hand. "'I'm better now. Come home directly, you cruel boy, come!' "'What's the matter, ma'am?' inquired one of the women. "'Oh, ma'am,' replied the young woman, "'he ran away near a month ago from his parents, who were hard-working and respectable people, and went and joined a set of thieves and bad characters, and almost broke his mother's heart.' "'Young wretch!' said one woman. "'Go home, you little brute!' said the other. "'I am not!' replied Oliver, gravely alarmed. "'I don't know her. I haven't any sister, or father and mother either. I'm an orphan. I live at Pentonville.' 
"'Only hear him how he braves it out!' cried the young woman. "'Why, it's Nancy!' exclaimed Oliver, who now saw her face for the first time, and started back in irrepressible astonishment. "'You see, he knows me!' cried Nancy, appealing to the bystanders. "'He can't help himself. Make him come home. There's good people, or he'd kill his dear mother and father and break my heart!' "'What the devil's this?' said a man, bursting out of a beer-shop, with a white dog at his heels. "'Young Oliver, come home to your poor mother, you young dog. Come home directly!' "'I don't belong to them. I don't know them. Help! Help!' cried Oliver, struggling in the man's powerful grasp. "'Help!' repeated the man. "'Yes, I'll help you, you young rascal. What books are these? You've been stealing them, have you? Give them here.' With these words the man tore the volumes from his grasp and struck him on the head. "'That's right!' cried a looker-on from a garret window. "'That's the way of bringing him to his senses.' "'To be sure,' said a sleepy-faced carpenter, casting an approving look at the garret window. "'It'll do him good,' said the two women. "'And he shall have it too,' rejoined the man, administering another blow and seizing Oliver by the collar. "'Come on, you young villain! Here, bull's-eye! Mind him, boy! Mind him!' Weak with recent illness, stupefied by the blows and the suddenness of the attack, terrified by the fierce growling of the dog and the brutality of the man, overpowered by the conviction of the bystanders that he really was the hardened little wretch he was described to be, what could one poor child do? Darkness had set in. It was a low neighbourhood. No help was near. Resistance was useless. In another moment he was dragged into a labyrinth of dark, narrow courts and was forced along them at a pace which rendered the few cries he dared to give utterance to unintelligible. It was a little moment, indeed, whether they were intelligible or no, for there was nobody to care for them, had they been ever so plain. The gas-lamps were lighted, Mrs. Bedwin was waiting anxiously at the open door, the servant had run up the street twenty times to see if there were any traces of Oliver, and still the two old gentlemen sat perseveringly in the dark parlour with a watch between them. End of chapter 15